a neuroscientist and principal researcher with the Affective Brain Lab. She's undertaken extensive research into the optimism bias. Our inherent belief as humans that the future will be better than the present. She's found that as humans, we're naturally biased to be optimistic. And in her research, she frequently takes a tour of the irrationally positive brain and investigates why people are resistant to warnings. She's presenting us with a talk here called The Surprising Science of Future Thinking. Would you please welcome Tally Sharrett. Thank you. I'm going to start by doing an experiment with all of you here. I want to test how you talk yourself into behaving well when you really want to behave badly. Now, I don't know if you thought about this before, but the way you go about it can be quite important, because it could change your everyday behavior and subsequently your health and your achievement. So let's do it. Imagine your favorite naughty little treat, and by that I mean food. So maybe it's a bag of crisps or a piece of chocolate cake. Imagine it right here in front of you. Now talk yourself into not eating it. How do you do that? Raise your hand if you do it by telling yourself it will make you fat. Me too. Well, it turns out that's not necessarily the best way to go about it. But before I tell you why, let's test one more thing. Let's test how you talk other people into behaving well when they really want to behave badly. So take a look at the image and imagine it's your kid or maybe a student. What would you tell him to make him stop smoking? Now, if you're like me, your gut reaction is to say, smoking will kill you, and by the way, you're in big, big trouble. So I don't know if you noticed, but what we're doing here is we're trying to shape our behavior as well as other people's behavior by inducing fear. We do it all the time. We do it at home, we do it at work. We do it because we have this belief that threatening people, that inducing fear will get them to act. Well, it turns out that's not the best way to do it. The science shows that warnings have only very limited impact on behavior. Graphic images on cigarette packets, for example, do not deter smokers from smoking. And one study showed that after looking at those images, quitting actually became a lower priority for smokers. Now, I'm not saying that warnings and threats never work, but what the science shows is that, on average, they have a very limited impact. Now, I'm sure you're asking yourself the same thing that I was asking myself when I learned about these studies. Why? And are there better ways to induce positive behavioral change? And the answer is yes. But before we talk about those, let's start with this really intriguing puzzle. Why are we resistant to warnings? So after many years of studying this in the lab, scientists around the world finally stumbled upon the answer. And here it is. <laughs> so seriously, when something threatens us, our immediate reaction is to protect ourselves. And yes, we can protect ourselves by making a spinach sweet kiwi smoothie for breakfast every morning, followed by a 10K barefoot run. But you know what will be much easier? What will take care of the threat immediately? Denial, rationalization, and generally distancing ourselves from the threat. And so without you knowing it, your psychological immune system kicks in and convinces you that the threat is not really relevant to you. You have really good genes. You will stop overspending and overdrinking just in time before something really bad happens. Now, this process can leave you feel more resistant than you were before. And that's why sometimes warnings have these boomerang effects. And all this happens completely outside of your awareness, leaving your positive self-image intact. Take the stock market, for example. Do you know when people log into their account to check on their stocks? Not to make a transaction, just to check. What you're seeing here in black is the S&P 500 value over two years. And in gray is a number of times that people logged into their account just to check, not to make a transaction. This is data from Carlson, Lowenstein, and Seppi. And by the way, it's not raw data. They corrected for all sorts of obvious confounds, like willingness to transact and market volume. So what do we see? What you see is that when the market is high, people log in all the time, because good information makes us feel good. 
so we seek it out. And when the market is low, people avoid logging in because bad news makes us feel bad. And all this happens as long as bad news can reasonably be ignored. But what you're not seeing here is what happened a few months later in the market collapse of 2008 when the market went down and people started logging in frantically, but it was a bit too late. So you can think about it like this. This is now. <laughs> and these are all the behaviors and warning sounds now. And they can lead to all this bad stuff later. So smoking and drinking now can lead you to health problems later. And if you procrastinate now, that can lead you to miss a deadline later. And climate change now can lead to natural disaster later. But not necessarily. Because there's many different routes from your present to your future. Right? It can go this way, or it can go that way, or it can go this way. And as time passes, you gather more and more information about where the wind is blowing. But you tell yourself, well, it can go this way, it can go that way. And at any point, you can intervene. You can act and maybe change the outcome. But you tell yourself, well, what's the point in worrying about something that might happen? It might not happen. Until you get to this point, at which time you jump into action, but sometimes it's a little bit too late. So this is what happened in the 2008 financial collapse, where the warning signs were there, but ignored, until things became very apparent, and the rest is history. Now, if you think about it, we do the same for our own health. Often there's warning signs that we ignore, even doctors telling us that actually we're not as invulnerable as we thought we were. We studied this phenomenon in the lab. We asked people to estimate their likelihood of experiencing all sorts of illnesses and bad events. So, for example, what do you think is your likelihood of suffering from hearing loss in your future? Let's say you think it's about 50%. Okay, I now give you opinions of two experts. Expert A gives you a rosier view. He says, you know, for someone like you, I think it's only 40%. Expert B gives you a bleaker view. He says, you know, for someone like you, I think it's actually 60%. It's worse. What do you do? You shouldn't change your beliefs, right? Wrong. What we found is that people tend to change their beliefs towards the opinion of the doctor that gives you a more rosier view. So you say, well, I think it's about 45%. And it turns out that the inability to learn from information we don't want to hear is worse in kids and teenagers. So we studied people from the age of 10 until the age of 80. And we found that kids and teenagers were the worst in accurately learning from information that they didn't want to hear. And this ability became better as we grew. But then, Around age 40, something interesting happened. Suddenly, the ability to learn from, good, from bad news started going down. Well, you may say that's not surprising. Any kind of learning will go up as we grow, and then, unfortunately, at some point, we'll start going down, right? But that's not what happened from learning from good news, like a doctor telling you, actually, you're stronger than what you thought you were. Learning from good news remained relatively stable throughout age. So what you see here is that the most vulnerable populations, kids and teenagers on one hand, and the elderly on the other hand, they were the least likely to learn from warnings. But no one is immune. If you're 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 60, everyone takes in information they want to hear more than information that they don't. Take this really intriguing study by David Ill and Justin Raoult. David and Justin invited groups of 10 people into their lab and asked them to rate how attractive everyone was, from the ugliest in the room to the most attractive. Then they asked each person where they thought they stood. Let's say you think you're about average. OK, David and Justin would tell you what other people thought of you. Well, it turns out if other people thought you were more attractive than you thought you were, you would quickly change your belief. You would say, well, maybe I'm more attractive than I thought I was. But if people thought you were much uglier than you thought, 
you wouldn't change your belief that much. You would say, well, it's subjective. They don't think I'm attractive, but my mom always said I'm really attractive. <laughs> so you end up with a view like this of yourself. <laughs> and our problem as teachers and mentors and parents is that instead of working with this positive image that people so effortfully maintain, we try and put a mirror in front of them. Worse, we tell them, you know, the image is going to get uglier and uglier. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work because the brain will frantically try to distort the image using Photoshop and fancy lenses until it gets the image it's happy with. But what will happen if we went along with how our brain works instead of against it? Take hand washing, for example. We all know that hand washing is the number one way to spread the, the disease. So in a hospital in the United States, a camera was installed to see how often medical staff will wash their hands before and after entering a patient's room. Well, the hospital staff, they knew a camera was installed. Nevertheless, only one in 10 medical staff sanitized their hands before and after entering a patient's room. But then an intervention was introduced an electronic board that told the staff how well they were doing, how well their shift was doing relative to the weekly rate. And what happened? Boom. Compliance raised to almost 90%, which is absolutely amazing. Now, the research team were amazed, so they made sure to replicate it in another division in the hospital, and again, the same results. So why does this intervention work so well? And this is really the important bit. There's a general message here. It works well because instead of using warnings about something that may happen in the future, it uses free principles that re know, really drive your mind and your action. Immediate rewards, social incentives, and progress. Let me explain. I'll start with immediate rewards. So in the hospital study, Every time you washed your hands, you saw the score going up on the board. And that made you feel good. Knowing that drove you to do something that you may otherwise not want to do. And eventually, it became a habit. Now, this works because we value immediate rewards, rewards that we're going to get now, more than rewards that we might get in the future. So yes, by doing the right thing now, you might be healthier and happier 20 years from now. But 20 years is such a long time, and who knows what's going to happen in 20 years. Maybe you'll be fine in 20 years, even if you behave badly now. And maybe you'll be altogether dead. So the here and now you would rather have that tangible drink, that tangible T-bone, that tangible cookie. If you think about it, it's not altogether irrational, right? You're taking a sure thing now rather than something that is uncertain in the future. But what will happen if you reward yourself and others now for doing things that are actually good for you in the future? So studies show that giving people immediate rewards make them more likely to quit smoking, more likely to start physical activity, more likely to, to go to medical screenings. And contrary to what people think, the effect can last for at least six months. At the beginning, people just do this to get the reward. But after a while, not smoking becomes associated with the reward. Going to the gym becomes associated with the reward. And eventually, it becomes a habit. It becomes a lifestyle. Take the biggest health insurance company in South Africa. They give their clients reward points every single time they go to the gym, every single time they buy healthy food in the supermarket. And using this method, they were able to change people's behavior to make them healthier. And it doesn't have to be a monetary reward. It can be something as simple as positive feedback. And we can do it in our own life. Reward yourself instantly when you do actions that are good for you also in the future. We bridge the temporal gap. Now, the second principle is social incentives. So in the hospital study, the medical staff could see on the board how well other people were doing. We're social creatures. We care about what other people are doing. We want to do the same, and we want to do it better. This is an image from a study that we conducted that was led by PhD student Micah Adelson. 
And what it's showing you is a signal in your brain's emotional center when you learn about the opinions of others. And that signal predicted how likely you were to conform, how likely you were to change your behavior. The British government is using this principle to get people to pay taxes on time. So normally, they would send a letter to people who forgot to pay their taxes on time, telling them how important it is to pay taxes. Well, that didn't work. So they added one sentence, and that sentence said, nine out of 10 people in Britain pay their taxes on time. And using that one sentence, they were able to induce compliance rates by 15%, and it's thought to bring into the government at least 160 million pounds. So using social incentive, what other people are doing, it's a very strong motivator to change behavior, ours and other people's. And the third principle is progress. So we have shown in the, the slide is gone. So yeah, progress. So in the hospital study, Instead of focusing your attention on disease, the electronic board focused your attention on getting your performance to be better, on improvement. Now, we have shown that the brain does a really good job in processing any type of information that suggests that the future is better than what you expected, and it doesn't do a very good job in suggesting that the future is worse. And it's not about more or less activity. That's not what this image is showing you. It's about a signal that accurately shows you how good or bad information is relative to what you thought. So what this suggests is that emphasizing to people how they can get better rather than how not getting worse can get you better results. So for example, you might tell yourself, I'm not going to eat that piece of chocolate cake because then I'm going to look much better. So emphasizing the progress, not the decline. When I tell people about this research, they ask, well, aren't we really sensitive to loss and harm? We do want to avoid harm. And I'm going to feel really bad in 20 years if I have lung cancer, much worse than the cigarette feels good right now. But the cigarette is certain, it's in my hand, and lung cancer is only a possibility. And in general, people believe that positive possibilities are more likely for them than negative possibilities. So here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that we should not communicate risks. And I'm not saying that people should not be made aware of the dangers out there. They should. And I'm also not saying that there's one principle or three principles that fit all. For example, you might want to use progress, telling this kid that by not smoking, he'll become better at sports. Or you might want to emphasize the social environments. If you know that everyone, um, all your friends, have signed up to the marathon, you might be more likely to sign up yourself. And to know what works, we really need empirical research. And that's really important when it comes to public policy and health campaigns. Because if you think about it, most health campaigns at the moment are fear campaigns. And so the message really is that if we want to change our behavior and the behavior of others, inducing fear alone may not be the right answer. And we might want to try instant rewards for actions that are good for us in the future, emphasizing progress and the positive behavior of others. And that's true at any age. Thank you. <laughs>